Good morning, everyone, and welcome to this celebration of the Eucharist. Please join me in singing our opening hymn, number 337, As Pants the Heart, number 337. circumstances to begin ordinary time, which, as I say every year on this Sunday, is far from ordinary. It is nothing less than the story of our salvation played out before us in word and in sacrament. As we begin this celebration, let us call upon our God, and let us open our hearts to receive them. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hidden. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, Jesus Christ, to save us from our sins to be our advocate in heaven, and to bring us to eternal life. Let us confess our sins in penitence and faith, firmly resolve to keep God's commandments, and to live in love and peace with all. Almighty God, our Heavenly Father, we have sinned against you and against our neighbor, in thought and word and deed through negligence, through weakness, through our own deliberate fault. We are truly sorry and repent of all our sins. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, who died for us, forgive us all that is past, and grant that we may serve you in newness of life, to the glory of your name. Amen. God, who forgives all who truly repent, have mercy upon you, 
pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in life eternal, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. reading from the book of Exodus. When they had journeyed from Rephidim and to the wilderness of Sinai and camped in the wilderness, Israel camped there in front of the mountain. Then Moses went up to God. The Lord called to him from the mountain, saying, Thus you shall say to the house of Jacob and tell the Israelites, You have seen what I did to the Egyptians and how I bore you on eagles' wings and brought you to myself. Now, therefore, if you obey my voice and keep my covenant, you shall be my treasured possession out of all the peoples. Indeed, the whole earth is mine, but you shall be for me a priestly kingdom and a holy nation. These are the words that you shall speak to the Israelites. So Moses came, summoned the elders of the people, and set before them all these words that the Lord had commanded him. The people all answered as one, everything that the Lord has spoken, we will do. This is the word of the Lord. We recite together the 100th Psalm. O be joyful in the Lord, all ye lands. Serve the Lord with gladness, and come before his presence with a song. Be ye sure that the Lord, he is God. It is he that hath made us, and not we ourselves. We are his people, and the sheep of his pasture. 
O oh, go your way into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and speak good of his name. For the Lord is gracious, his mercy is everlasting, and his truth endureth from generation to generation. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Ghost, as it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. A reading from the letter of St. Paul to the Romans. Since we are justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have obtained access to this grace in which we stand. And we boast in our hope of sharing the glory of God. And not only that, but we also boast in our sufferings, knowing that suffering produces endurance, and endurance produces character, and character produces hope. And hope does not disappoint us, because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit that has been given to us. For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. Indeed, rarely would anyone die for a righteous person, though perhaps for a good person someone might actually dare to die. But God proves his love for us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. This is the word of the Lord. Our graduate hymn is hymn number 408, Love Divine, All Loves Excelling, number 408.
The Lord be with you. Hear the Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to St. Matthew. Jesus went about all the cities and villages, teaching in their synagogues and proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and curing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he had compassion for them, because they were harassed and helpless, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore ask the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Then Jesus summoned his twelve disciples and gave them authority over unclean spirits to cast them out and to cure every disease and sickness. These are the names of the twelve apostles. First Simon, also known as Peter, and his brother Andrew, James, son of Zebedee, and his brother John, Philip and Bartholomew, Thomas and Matthew, the tax collector, James, son of Alphaeus and Thaddeus, Simon, the Canaanian, and Judas Iscariot, the one who betrayed him. These twelve Jesus sent out with the following instructions. Go nowhere among the Gentiles and enter no town of the Samaritans, but go rather to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. As you go, proclaim the good news. The kingdom of heaven has come near. Cure the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, cast out demons. You received without payment, give without payment. This is the Gospel of the Lord. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. When I was a child, there was a family who lived near us by the name of Alan, to whom we had several connections. The father of the family, Russell, was a good friend of my Aunt Geraldine, the Queen of the Sandbar Tavern, about whom I've spoken many times with great admiration. Aunt Jerry was frequently referred to as the black sheep of my mother's family, and that's saying a lot coming from that tenebrous flock. But I think a more loyal, faithful, and loving friend you'd be hard-pressed to find, and she loved her pal Russell a great deal. Since Russell and his wife divorced when I was quite young, I knew him mainly through my aunt. And if she said Russell was a great guy, Russell was a great guy. The Allens had three children, and we had connections with them as well. The eldest was named Steve, who was possessed of the most beautiful, crinkly-eyed smile, and had hair that went way beyond his collar. As a child, my hair care was in the hands of others, mainly my not-the-long-hair type father and buzzer-happy Mac the barber. And he used to imagine what it would be like to have hair that moved with the breeze, as did Steve Allen's. Next came Stacy, who was my sister Kathy's age, and a friend of hers. Stacy was the most exotically beautiful creature I had ever seen, with long, flowing, dark hair and the most mesmerizing, almond-shaped blue eyes. I was precocious and chatty to a fault with my sister's other friends, but Stacy was so exquisite that her mere presence had the ability to shut me up. No small feat, anyone who knew me as a child can tell you. And then there was Stephanie, a few years younger than I and one of my besties. With a ready smile like Steve's and a shocking beauty like Stacy's, Steph was a fantastic companion through childhood and adolescence, whose presence always ensured that some sort of shenanigans would ensue when we were together and who made sure that I never took things too terribly seriously. But more than Russell, Steve, Stacy, and Stephanie, if I really think about connections, if I really close my eyes and think about their big, beautiful old house that they called home, it is the face of the matriarch of the family that appears in my mind's eye, the captivating Judy, Jude. 
From my earliest days, I would have to say sincerely that more often than not, I bounded up on the back porch and walked unannounced through the kitchen door of the Allen home just to be able to chew the fat of Jude. She was a great listener and would lean forward and treat the pronouncements of this odd little boy as if they had come from the oracle of Delphi. But it wasn't one-sided. Jude talked to me, seemed to be possessed of the ability not only to see some precocious kid who needed to be humored, but rather a fellow journeyer who, though not as experienced in the ways of the world as she was nevertheless, was a worthy partner in the communication that she had to offer. You know what I mean, she would constantly say, and there was no lilting at the end of the sentence that transformed it into a question, but rather it was a statement. I did know what she meant. In a world where so many would say that things had to be a certain way, where people had to be a certain way, Jude had the ability to look at the same things that everyone else was looking at and see something completely different. You know what I mean. So for instance, in her kitchen, where most would look up and see a ceiling that maybe needed to be painted and reach for the paint and brushes, Jude cut out pockets from her children's outgrown Levi's, attaching them there and transforming that ceiling into a kind of benediction of memory, of nurturing. And in the staircase that went up to the second floor, having torn down the wallpaper to eventually replace it, Steve, Stacy, and Stephanie's friends were allowed to write messages on the bare walls, transforming that staircase into a colorful benediction of story, of love. I'm sure some people would look at that denim-colored ceiling and that plaster wall with all that writing on it and see nothing more than eccentricity or oddity. But not me. With Jude as my guide, I saw possibility. I saw challenge. I saw the reality that though many would say there was only one way to do something, and they would so focus on the how that they lost sight of the why, sitting underneath that denim, writing my messages on that wall, I knew that there were many ways to involve myself in that benediction of memory, of nurturing, of story, of love. I just needed to believe that these things were important and then simply find my own way of bringing them to a world and a people in great need of that benediction of memory, of nurturing, of story of love. You know what I mean. In this morning's Gospel from St. Matthew, we have Jesus presenting a kind of road map of missionary activity. And though we frequently tend to hear the word missionary in a rather limited way, conjuring up people, images of people going to the far reaches of the earth to tell others and preach and teach of Jesus Christ, in reality, we are all called to be missionaries, of course, each in his own way. The very nature of our baptism in Christ demands this of us. And so St. Matthew gives us this four-part treatise of the Lord, which he lays out for us how this entire missionary endeavor works. Firstly, Jesus discerns a clear need for missionary activity, and how does he do this? He, filled with compassion, travels around listening to people, understanding what they need. And what they need first and foremost, of course, is the good news of love and compassion that he seeks to bring to them. Secondly, he chooses and recognizes certain people who will bring the good news in particular ways. Everyone is called to proclaim the gospel, of course, but Jesus establishes that some are given particular responsibilities for the good of all. Thirdly, he lays out exactly what this missionary activity is to look like. God's kingdom is not solely about some blissful period at the end time. It is about now. 
It is about people who are in real need right now, who deserve a little more than platitudes like, this will make you stronger, or you'll get through this, or there'll be no suffering in heaven, but rather deserve to be tended to and cared for in their suffering right now. And fourthly, he lets those involved in missionary activity know that it's not always going to be a bed of roses, that the cost of following him could at times be high, but that we will be strengthened for our task by keeping in mind, in our minds and our hearts, the proper attitude. Obviously, all four of these points are equally important, but I think the challenge for most of us tends to be in the third part, because we can easily see that there is a need for the good news that Jesus offers. We can, perhaps at times begrudgingly, readily acknowledge that some people are singled out for ministry in a particular way. We can, though difficult, understand the things and people which might block us in our endeavors and seek not to allow them to limit our mission. But the third part, what this activity looks like, can be difficult to grasp. Are we really supposed to go out and find lepers? What could we possibly do to raise someone from the dead? Are there even demons anymore? And if so, what exactly must we do to vanquish them? And so, in trying to answer these questions, the Church historically has forged ahead with an idea of what it means to be a missionary, how the good news would be spread. But here's the problem. All too frequently, we have done so without the first part of Jesus' roadmap, listening to what people need. And so the Church has had to sit in shame and penitence for our treatment of indigenous peoples at a time, and time and time again, our actions have been about promoting some unholy notion of empire rather than spreading the gospel of Jesus Christ. And this misguided notion of empire, of course, does not limit itself to Africa or South America. Anytime we, in the name of Christian mission, refuse to listen to others or impose our own ideas on those who for a variety of reasons may be weaker or more vulnerable than we are, we are promoting a concept of Christian missionary activity that is directly contrary to the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so what are we to do? We who seek seriously to heed this desire of Jesus that the good news be spread. Well, it seems to me we need to be open to changing our understanding. We need to be open to the fact that our desire to follow Jesus can take some wrong turns now and then and lead us to be mired in unhelpful or even unhealthy notions of what the body of Christ is all about. And we need to correct that which is wrong, especially in the institutional church. And we need to move towards that which is right. We need to see possibility. We need to see challenge. We need to see the reality that though many would say there is only one way to do something, and so focus on the how that they lose sight of the why, we, sitting under God's grace, writing our messages to the world, need to know that there are many ways to involve ourselves in the benediction of memory, of nurturing, of story, of love. We just need to believe that these things are important, and then simply find our own way of bringing them to the world and to people in great need. You know what I mean. And so we listen. We listen to the cries of those in need, and we do what they need, not necessarily what we would have for them. And so when we are to heal the sick, it does not necessarily mean a physical healing, although it can, but can also mean that we hear the voices of the lonely and the sorrowful, and we heal them by our non-judgmental love and compassion. And when we are to raise the dead, it does not simply mean a physical resurrection, although it can, 
but can also mean that we hear the voices of those who have stopped living meaningful lives, and we restore them to life through offering them the most important reason to live. And when we are to cleanse lepers, it does not simply mean a physical cleansing, although it can, but can also mean that we are to be manifestations of love for those who live on the margins of society today, those who are rejected and feared and judged by so many drug addicts and alcoholics and criminals, the homeless and sex workers, and we are to cleanse them in our acceptance and when we are to cast out devils, it does not simply mean a physical exorcism, although it can, but can also mean that we are to liberate people from the demons of anger, hatred, violence, division, and fear through a love which we know casts out all fear. This is where Jesus' roadmap of missionary activity will lead us that we listen to the voices of those in need without imposing our judgment on them, and that we arrive at a fuller understanding of the power of God in our lives and in the world. These are the important things. How God calls us to do this can be as varied and wonderful as are we varied and wonderful, like those beautiful pieces of denim different sizes and shapes and colors, like that colorful white writing on the staircase wall, different ideas and visions. You know what that means. You know what I mean, excuse me. I'm getting my people mixed up. It's been a few years since I've seen Jude. And my family sold our place there 35 years ago, so I don't make it back there very frequently. She sadly had some rough times over the past few years. Her son Steve, with a beautiful smile, passed away, and Jude's faced some health problems of her own. I'd like to think I'll see her again someday, but of course I live half a world away now, and it's all especially complicated in this period. And naturally, this idea makes me sad. But you know me and my belief in the power of stories and the benediction of memory, of nurturing, of story and love really is forever. And I can imagine it all as if I were still a boy sitting underneath that denim ceiling, recounting my adventures and dreams. And I can imagine her listening, as she always did, and in a world where so many would say that things have to be a certain way, that people have to be a certain way, I can imagine Jude once again demonstrating her ability to look at the same things that everyone else is looking at and see something completely different. We need people like that in our world today. And so, naturally, we need to be people like that in this world of ours. You know what I mean. Amen. Together now we profess what it is that we believe, what it is that we hold dear, what it is that we strive to believe, as is formulated the words of the Creed. We believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord, Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten, not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation he came down from heaven, was incarnate from the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and was made man. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, the giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken through the prophets. We believe in one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Confident that God hears us when we cry out to him in our need, we now place our petitions before him. As Jesus called the twelve to be disciples, make all members of the church faithful followers in the way that he taught. Strengthen the hope and love that belong to Christian people. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. By the Holy Spirit, bring the radiance of your love into the hearts of all who do not know you. Make the gospel known to those who wander as lost sheep in the world. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Open our eyes to recognize the needs of others who come close to us. As we go on our way, fill us with desire to speak the good news of the kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Relieve those who suffer from any kind of sickness. Empower those who care for them. Give new hope to those who have lost it through distress of body or mind. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. As the living receive your divine compassion in their suffering, grant mercy to those who have died and gather them into your eternal kingdom. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Merciful Father, accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Lord Jesus Christ, you said to your apostles, I leave you peace, my peace I give you. Look not on our sins, but on the faith of your church and grant us the peace and unity of your kingdom, where you live forever and ever. And may the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let us share with one another a sign of Christ's peace. Our offertory hymn is hymn number 353, Dear Lord and Father of Mankind, number 353. <laughs>
Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Father, we give you thanks and praise to your beloved Son, Jesus Christ, your living Word, through whom you have created all things, who was sent by you in your great goodness to be our Savior. By the power of the Holy Spirit, he took flesh. As your Son, born of the Blessed Virgin, he lived on earth and went about among us. He opened wide his arms for us on the cross. He put an end to death by dying for us and revealed the resurrection by rising to new life. So he fulfilled your will and won for you a holy people. Therefore, with angels and archangels, with all the company of heaven, we proclaim your great and glorious name, forever praising you and singing. Almighty Father. 
power forever and ever. Amen. Let us pray with confidence as our Savior has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. We break this bread to share in the body of Christ. Though we are many, we are one body, because we all share in one bread. Jesus is the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those to be called to his supper. Lord, I am not worthy to receive you, but only say the word, and I shall be healed.
let us pray. Eternal Father, we thank you for nourishing us with these heavenly gifts. May our communion strengthen us in faith, build us up in hope, and make us grow in love. For the sake of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Almighty God, we thank you for feeding us with the body and blood of your Son, Jesus Christ. Through him we offer you our souls and bodies to be a living sacrifice. Send us out in the power of your Spirit to live and work to your praise and glory. Amen. A few announcements this morning. First of all, our service schedule is as it has been, so we'll have morning prayer Monday through Friday on uh, YouTube, which will be available by 9 a.m. each day, sometimes a lot earlier, sometimes just at the end by 9 a.m. Depends on technology. And we have, it's Monday through Friday, we have evening prayer Monday through Friday uh, on YouTube, also by uh, 6 p.m. We aim to have that up. Again, could be earlier. Uh, of course, we're all very excited and anxious about being able to open the churches for individual prayer. And as you may imagine, or maybe you may not imagine, there's a lot that has to be done before we can do this and do this safely and to kind of meld people's desire to have a special certain place to pray and to provide that for them safely. So we will open our churches uh, when we're ready. We'll have a meeting Monday night that should be the final meeting of a series of many meetings that we've been having. Uh, and I can uh, let you know a few more details on Tuesday morning. So look for that uh, email from me uh, probably for Tuesday morning prayer. So, uh, yeah, thank, thank, uh, thank God. And thank you also, of course, as I said before, to the church wardens and PCC secretaries and fabric officers who are doing a lot of the behind the scenes uh, work to get us ready to be offered, to be able to offer this, this experience of prayer to people. So thanks so much to them. And thanks also to all of you who uh, have been and continue to be very patient in this rather difficult situation we find ourselves in. But church continues, we continue to grow, our missionary activity continues unabated. And I think we can only go up from here when we also have beautiful churches again that we can say some prayers in. So thanks be to God for all of that. And we'll have, hear more details uh, earlier this week, day after tomorrow. Thank you. Our final hymn is hymn number 484, The Church's One Foundation, number 484.
peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in the knowledge and love of God and of his Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. And the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit be among you and remain with you always. Amen. Go in peace to love and serve the Lord. In the name of Christ.